a teenager, just being a teenager, sits at the table with the massive family surrounding him. This Thanksgiving is a big deal. He no longer has to sit at the kids' table. He's moving up in the world, and that includes all the way to the adult table. But he's still 13, and like any 13-year-old, his mind is on a thousand things all in a split second. Aunt Lucy says the prayer. Plates begin to get passed. Small conversations begin. Still in his own world, the teenage boy receives the plate of turkey from his mother, takes a couple of pieces of dark meat because everyone knows that dark meat is the best, and he hears, you're welcome. With these simple words, the young man is awoken from these thousands of thoughts going on in his head, and in a split second, he processes what just happened. Let's see now. Aunt Lucy said the prayer. Geez, there's a lot of people in this crammed dining room. This dining room's really noisy. I was thinking about X, Y, Z, receive the plate of turkey, and oh, I get it. I forgot to say I'm I forgot to say thank you. Once he's figured out what just happened, he responds to his annoyed mother and her, you're welcome, with a sad, so very sad, thank you. As soon as he says it, it falls flat and he realizes how lame it sounds. She's clearly perturbed and so he goes back to thinking about X, Y, and Z and swirls the dark meat in the gravy and digs in. Thankful, sure, but a little annoyed with his mother, too. When a thank you is expected, it just isn't the same, is it? When someone has to prompt you to be thankful, can your gratitude really be genuine? A thank you note is a wonderful thing, but only when you don't expect it. If you head to the mailbox every evening, searching, waiting, expecting the thank you note, inevitably you will be disappointed. If you receive the thank you note, then you assume it was written out of obligation. If you don't receive the thank you, then clearly someone does not appreciate your generosity. But if you've given of yourself purely out of said generosity, wholeheartedly as a genuine response of gratitude, then no thank you is required. And if perchance you receive one, let's face it, it's cherished that much more. So while I wonder what God thinks when we sit down at the dinner table, bow our heads and squeeze and squint our eyes together and recite some rote prayer, of thanksgiving. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. Amen. Pass the gravy. Or bless this food to our use and to us, us to thy service. Fill our hearts with grateful praise. Amen. Those kinds of prayers have never seemed very genuine to me, though as a child my family usually recited one of them. Prayers out of obligation, after all, are not really prayers at all. Because to be truly prayer, there has to be relationship involved. There has to be relating going on. There has to be some sort of give and take. And it cannot only be an obligation. And so we come. We come to this passage that was read from Deuteronomy this morning, the final book of the Torah. It's a Moses passage. And it, it's, it's a, it, it is a passage of obligation though there's few people in Scripture that related more closely to God than Moses. Moses and God, you see, they're really tight. I mean, if you read about Moses in this First Testament, some Christians call it Old Testament, but I think that's a derogatory term. I prefer First Testament. You say what you want. Moses and God are really tight, and if you read the Scriptures at all, you see that God pulls Moses way out of his comfort zone. He convinces Moses to do some pretty amazing things, all with God's own chosen children. And as you would expect from any relationship, 
Moses, in turn, draws God way out of her comfort zone, challenging the Holy One to help a prophet out on occasion. Several occasions, really. At this point in the Deuteronomic story, in this point in the First Testament story, Moses is still the Israelites' leader and prophet, but Moses is getting old. And together with Moses and the people, they are closing in on the end of their 40-year sentence together. This 40-year sentence in the wilderness. The days of looking over the land of milk and honey, but not being allowed into it, they're literally and figuratively almost over. It's in sight for everyone but Moses, of course. The Hebrew people are on the cusp of receiving all that God, a faithful and always giving creator, has promised his very own creation and people. But before they receive it, Moses wants to make sure these people remember to be thankful. Moses wants to be sure these hardened pessimists, all of them wandering the wilderness for all of these years, he wants to make sure that they remember to show a little gratitude, and so he makes it clear they will be expected to write a thank you note at least once a year. And Moses does so with this little bit of liturgical law you find in Deuteronomy. I think a preacher could say that right, right? These words are prescriptive for the Israelites. It reminds them of the priority that God should take in their lives reminding them to put first things first. When you have come into the land that your Lord God is giving you as an inheritance to possess, and you possess it and settle in it, you shall take some of the first of all fruit of the ground which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And you will return basically the first fruits of your labor as a blessing to God. You will be thankful. And when you have successfully harvested and given the first fruits back to God, then along with the clergy and the aliens who reside among you, all of you together shall celebrate with all the bounty that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house. It'll be Thanksgiving. Moses is well aware of just how ungrateful the Israelites have been after being freed from slavery, something he led them in, released from their captivity in Egypt, and he is not about to see the people go into the promised land and be ungrateful, be ungrateful for all that God is doing in their lives. He's not about to let it happen. Moses is scared, and rightfully so, that the people will be unappreciative. So he takes the liberty of prescribing when and how the people are to show their thanksgiving. And if we're honest about things, even if it is a prescribed gratitude, and even if it is a bit like expecting a thank you note, or or being told you're welcome as a reminder to say thank you, if we're honest about it, God's creation, all of us, have a bad habit of not being genuinely appreciative. Maybe we say the rote prayer before a meal. Maybe we show up at church when things are really good or really bad. Maybe we post something to Facebook every month in November, every day in November, naming some new thing that we are fortunate enough to possess. But genuine Thanksgiving is about putting first things first. Genuine Thanksgiving is an unprompted response to the richness of life, a life transformed by the grace and love of God. So what are your first fruits? What are your first fruits and are you offering them to God out of a deep sense of thanksgiving? This Thursday in New York, Macy's will present their annual Thanksgiving Day Parade for the 87th year in a row. Parade is a Thanksgiving tradition, but it also signals the beginning of the almighty Christmas shopping season. 
And just a few years ago, the best deals were for the early birds, and you got up early the Friday after Thanksgiving, but not anymore. Now you've got to be a night owl to get the best deals. And you don't even have to be much of a night owl anymore. This year, Macy's in New York and around the U.S. will open their doors for business at 8 o'clock on Thanksgiving Day. Walmart, Target, Kmart, Best Buy, virtually every other massive retail store will also be battling for your Black Friday dollars. Some of them as early as 6 p.m. Don't have to be a night owl for 6 p.m., do you? And if you want the best deals, then you might even think about skipping Thanksgiving altogether. Spend the whole day in line waiting for the cheapest that you'll ever see that item that doesn't fill the void we all want filled. So before we go any further, let's talk a little bit about priorities. Let's put our priorities in order. Let's put first things first and spend a moment celebrating a little Thanksgiving. There is, after all, so much that all of us have to be thankful for and grateful for. And this morning, I especially want to highlight some of the things you can give thanks for as a church. You come up with your own at your Thanksgiving dinner in between now and then and put your priorities first, first things first with your priorities. But this morning, let's talk a little bit about what we can give thanks for as church. Let's start with the music. You know, it's another morning, and honestly, I find myself expecting it, right? I just take it for granted. Do you take it for granted? Every Sunday, it's so extraordinary, and it's so easy to take all of these folks for granted. But we should be thankful for it, not take it for granted. And talk about taking something for granted. How about the ushers? You know, they greet you every morning. They hand you a bulletin. They show a level of warmth and hospitality. And they are amazing. And still, we just walk by most mornings. Yeah, yeah, good morning. Yeah, thanks for the bulletin. If you have these gifts for hospitality, and if you have these gifts for, for welcoming, by the way, Ned Sutro would love to talk to you. And if you don't want to talk to Ned, talk to Shanna or I, and we'll help get you set up so that you can be another one of the underappreciated ushers around here. <laughs> but thanks to these people for sure. I need to brag on our Seekers class. This group arrives early at 9.30 each and every Sunday, all so they can spend some time fulfilling their spirits, stretching their understanding of scriptures. They gather to discover new things about God's activity and walking with each other on the journey of life and faith. It's incredibly life-giving. And we would love for you to come give it a shot any Sunday that you would like. And while I'm outright bragging, let's talk outreach for a moment. George Pelham and I delivered 10 big boxes of food that we collected for HopeNet this past month. Thank you all for your generosity. Every bit counts and every bit matters. Your outreach committee has purchased, as I mentioned, 300 books to restock, update, and add excitement, honestly, to the Commonwealth Elementary School Library. Starting this next Sunday, we again are asking for your help to give kids the gift of literature, to show them a love for reading, and to do it all as a little bit of a Christmas present. You know, all of that's highlighted to say that First Church really is making a difference in this community. And I think we should all give thanks for the ways that we're engaged in that together. Let's give thanks for our leadership, folks. The church council, the trustees, the deacons. For all there is to be thankful for around here. And I'm trying to make the point that there's a lot to be thankful for. This church is not without its challenges. And what I'm most thankful for is that we have leaders, you and me, we together have leaders willing to face these challenges head on. They've proven it over and over again in the last year and years past, and they continue to plan and plot a responsible future for First Congregational Church of Los Angeles. I can't tell you how important that is. But keep in mind too, responsibility is not without its fair share of pain. But our lay leadership 
and our staff leadership and so many of you are collaborating in extraordinary ways and we're sharing the burden together. And I thank you for that. And I hope when you meet someone that is a trustee or you see one of these folks that is a deacon, you will thank them as well. I'm thankful that our present and future are in the best of hands and rooted in the healthiest of spirits. By the way, this collaboration, this, this kind of collaboration is on display today. After worship, when we all head downstairs to feast and rejoice together as church, you will do so with the idea that the Women's Association is underwriting everything that we don't pay for. When we asked for their help, they stepped up and they agreed to do this for us today, a strong affirmation of what can be done when we are church together. And in the next couple of weeks, you will come to worship and you will find this sanctuary decorated for the holidays. And that is something that our altar guild finds responsibility for. And folks, it doesn't just happen by itself. These are people that are working with and for and among us, and we are church together. Something to be celebrated for sure. We have so much to be thankful for at First Church, but it's really all about the people. People are the common thread. Adults serving out of their gifts, all of us being counted in, and kids. Man, I hear more stories about kids dragging their parents to church these days from our very own kids. It's, it's the greatest thing ever. All of my Thanksgiving is about you. I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for your desire to journey to seek God in the world, to seek God together. Thankful for what God is doing with you and with all of us. It's one small taste of God's living love and grace. When we are present to all that we have to be thankful for, when we're present to our own thanksgiving, when we see just how transformed we are and how transformative we can be, when we pause to put our relating to the holy first, we cannot help but to respond with utter gratitude. We cannot help but to have a deep desire to offer our first fruits to God in thanksgiving. And when we put first things first, thanksgiving is the inevitable response. And my prayer is that it may be so this year, certainly for the Thanksgiving holiday, but throughout the year for you and for me and for our world. Thanks be to God for all of you. Amen. <laughs>